Welcome everybody. I'm very proud um, to be hosting the session from the Internet of Production Alliance at the Open Source Summit. Uh, we're going to be talking about open hardware and more specifically um, stories of open hard hardware in what we call an Internet of Production. Uh, we're very proud to be presenting this today because a lot of our inspiration comes from the open source software movement. Um, I want to start off uh, by, a, by getting us all together on a sort of paradigm shift. We all here want to reinvent manufacturing. Uh, we want to think about the possible futures um, of what manufacturing in the world could look like. And actually what we're gonna talk about is what, it already, what this future already looks like today. So with that started, the people who will be speaking to you are very, uh, very diverse and more specifically very global. It's great that we can do a, an online version of this event because I'm right now in Denmark. My name is Barbara Schack. I'm the coordinator of the Internet Production Alliance. I'm joined by Cristina in Spain, by Rawa in Iraq, and by Emilio in El Salvador. So lots of different time zones. I don't know for you all, but I believe it's the afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. So welcome all of you. And without further ado, I'll start by telling you what is it that we mean by an internet of production. So to the right over here, you'll see what is the predominant paradigm of production today since the industrial revolution. Um, it's relied on economies of scale where one single design is mass produced and able to reach millions of consumers. This paradigm has enabled billions of people to achieve a higher quality of life than was like an unimaginable even at our grandparents' generation. But this success has concentrated the power of making and producing um, in the hands of relatively few either designers or producers or both. And it cements geopolitical structures where they currently are. So to make this tangible, imagine the label, um, an object saying design in California, made in China. Um, this is what we are living in and somewhat stuck in and trying to evolve from. Why? Because it contributes to like wider global economic and social changes. And we're talking about, of course, environmental destruction from the long supply chains. We're also talking about unsafe migration from two locations of production or two locations of power, unhappiness in a consumer society and intergenerational poverty because we get locked in, well, here you can produce this and here you can produce that and here you can't produce anything. And this goes through generation after generation. And and last, but I guess not least, what we know now is this seemed like a really efficient supply chain, but it's actually a very fragile system. It's got no resilience to crisis. It's got very few nodes that can fail. Very few nodes and each of them can fail. It leaves us incapable of getting what we want, when we need it, where we need it, at, based on what we currently have in that location. So that's where we are right now and quite recently actually. And we at the Internet of Production Lines envision a different manufacturing future. Because we observe that already today emerging technologies, they're allowing us to move from this slow and inefficient global supply chain to a future where it's data and knowledge that is shared across the world, that is shipped across the world digitally, but physical products are made as locally as possible and where they are actually needed. And, and by we, I mean the Internet of Production Alliance. So I guess it's time I introduce us. This is our vision. We are a group of people that believe in this vision, or more specifically, we believe in a future of production that lies in this decentralized manufacturing where there's global knowledge, local production from locally sourced material, less logical impact, and we work on that link in the middle, the digital infrastructure. We're alliance of, we're individuals as well as organizations uh, across the globe that are, that are working together on the, on the infrastructures needed to make this possible, the, the digital infrastructures. Um, and to, I'll put this out there right now, we would love for you all to join us. Um, to make this tangible, I'll go into details later, but let's start by making this really tangible. Let's take 
one of the very big questions of globalized and decentralized production. Our first storyteller will be Christina. She is the co-founder and chief innovation officer at Wikifactory. And Christina, can you please tell us more about decentralized manufacturing and design? An absolute pleasure to be here. Thanks, Barbara. This is a great, great panel. Um, and it's directly tied to our very beginnings. Um, because you're right, uh, it was open source software, uh, hardware, apologies, that um, really inspired us um, already now eight years back when fundamentally we started to see I uh, was part of um, a community called Espians of technologists that were uh, very interested in bringing, let's say, the latest technologies uh, and applied to context of social innovation, to sustainability, uh, accessibility. And uh, we were very inspired by early open hardware initiatives like Open Desk uh, that were uh, sharing furniture, uh, the work of Emilio already of Apropedia, um, initiatives like uh, Enable. Specifically, it was WikiHouse that um, were our neighbors in, in our co working space. And um, in effect, one of our colleagues had supported WikiHouse, which is an open community of architects that were sharing the not only the, the designs and the documentation openly, but very much also an infrastructure to build open communities around their open source architecture uh, construction kit. And what was really inspiring is, um, you know, um, in effect, whilst they were really showing that, you know, the future of design and production is, about, is not about shipping, uh, let's say the biscuit, but shipping the recipe. Um, in effect, they were able to inspire that, that future is not one of, uh, let's say a plug and play um, um, approach where solutions are just downloaded uh, by the web, um, but rather that they would be contextualized. And it was through local knowledge and local needs, local materials, that it really inspired us as a team to want to support initiatives like WikiHouse. That in effect, you was it was kickstarted or it was inspired by an initial house that was uh, released in open source in in the UK for sustainable building. Uh, it was then replicated by a team in New Zealand when the earthquake in Christchurch hit the city and they needed to be able to build homes fast. And the CNC fabbed open source design was exactly a design that they could remix to make it earthquake resistant. And then you had people in say Portugal that said, why use plywood in the CNC sheets if I can use cork? Because cork is our local uh, potential sheet material. Or how can we use um, the uh, construction kit, the logic of it to retrofit the favelas in, in Rio? And chapters around the world were really using local knowledge. And for me that particularly uh, as an entrepreneur in social innovation really inspired uh, the vision of, of what the future of design and production could look like if, in effect, uh, this community had an infrastructure that was similar to the uh, infrastructure that software developers had. Uh, because at the time, we were trying to support WikiHouse uh, with a major campaign that they were about to launch, and we were so surprised as, as a team of technologists that really a GitHub did not exist, that the base infrastructure for a team to work together around their files, around their designs, their documentation, so that indeed you could have a, a global community trying to solve problems together, but at the same time reusing their components and, and, and basically uh, building on the shoulder of giants like software does, um, that we needed to build this, that that was one of the missing kernels from an infrastructure perspective, and therefore a GitHub for, for hardware. Um, and, and of course, we looked at the best practices open, of open source of GitHub at the time, and uh, we launched our, our tool with, in, in essence, the essential uh, kits, uh, tools to be able to work together around the virtual designs. Uh, in effect, the repository systems with version control with for CAD, uh, the viewer aspects so that you could actually uh, collaborate <clears throat> on CAD software on kind of designs, um, regardless of whether you had uh, the CAD software installed or whether you had um, a plugin installed, we really wanted to make sure that uh, the accessibility gains that uh, tools like GitHub uh, offered for software developers uh, was passed through to, to the design and, and, and maker community in effect that was emerging. And it's 
uh, been a really beautiful process because when we first launched, we literally went to the hundred, if not thousand initial projects that inspired us till that date and told them we want to co-create and co-build this platform with you. And now we have a community of over 100,000 designers and engineers <clears throat> around the world working on over 6,000 projects, uh, ranging from drones to furniture, to agritech, to bio lab equipment, to medical devices, thanks to, um, to the amazing community efforts during, during COVID, of course. And, and I'm very excited because uh, contrary to when we first started as a platform, um, uh, where maybe we were riding in the, like say, slope, uh, a trough of disillusionment after a huge series, uh, stage of, 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 let's say, overhyped um, enthusiasm around new tools like 3D printing and CNC. Um, I feel like right now we're in this kind of slope uh, of, of, of enlightenment, of, of actually being able to see that on the one hand, the network of digital fabrication has matured. I think this year is a significant year that it's now, it's, uh, now um, in terms of percentage orders of, of things that are being made by the community, uh, by the micro factories around the world. Uh, the percentage of, um, of those things that are made being prototypes or final end products have now shifted towards final end products finally, uh, because of course there were a few, let's say, critiques around digital fabrication as really offering a network of production for local production that you know tr definitely uh, inspired us uh, and, and, and inspires uh, a whole community around the world. Um, really, we've seen a maturation in 2020, 20 and 21 as well, that uh, gives us hope that you know, um, we have such a network from, from a micro factory point of view that really can challenge the globalization of production because indeed COVID has made it so clear that uh, when um, supply chains are stressed, we need local production. And so I feel like um, from, a, from a, you know, an enabling technology perspective and the communication of it, uh, people really understand uh, why we need to distribute our supply chains more than ever. Um, and in effect, we have now hundreds of manufacturing uh, as a service providers, not just a, uh, uh, the maturation of the network itself of actual micro factories and the technologies that they use. But now we have hundreds literally of, of manufacturing uh, as a service providers um, online where you can send your part or your prototype uh, to be made. And the truth is that there are now over 25 million product developers are working remotely on virtual as virtual teams uh, working around their designs. And, and they need to be able to interface as smoothly as possible uh, with this manufacturing network. And that's why um, it is so exciting for me to say that um, as a brand promise, because of course um, we wanted to really empower uh, collaboration around design and production. And we first launched with the essential, let's say features to be able to work around your design virtually. But the brand promise is really to enable uh, a hardware developer to iterate as fast on their product as a software developer can with their apps, to put it that way. And um, therefore the manufacturing element of that equation for hardware developers is, is, is really been the challenge that we've been trying to face over the last few months, seeing that COVID has accelerated people's interest and, and concern about supply chains. We have prioritized um, to work on the key technologies, the key web technologies that could facilitate um, actually our community to work directly with manufacturers to discuss and engage um, the last mile of, of actual problem solving, real problem solving that it takes to replicate a design because there is an elephant in the room. There is the trend of industry 4.0 um, that uh, most people have heard about the advances of technology uh, of industry 4.0 is really limited to big companies and it's engendering a lot of siloed development. Um, and in effect, it's not uh, a trend that SMEs and startups can affordably or accessibly uh, participate in. So really we wanna make sure that in, in effect, SMEs and startups and the independent community worldwide have access to the latest web technologies for design to production. So we're very soon gonna make it possible through the repository to be able to send your files uh, to be made and be able to invite your manufacturer into your CAD, uh, CAD models and discuss 
um, and annotate uh, the manufacturing specifications on how it should be made, what materials, uh, what tolerances, in effect, the design for manufacturing information that's so key for replication. And these are the like hard, boring um, challenges that we're trying to face as a platform because we really do believe that 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 the future of design and production is going to be powered by an ingenious community worldwide that takes advantage of these tools to, in effect, provide local solutions where they're needed and on demand. So thank you so much for, for having the opportunity of sharing this. It really does connect back to our, our original roots and, and to the challenge that we face today. Very cool, Christina. Um, I believe you had promised me a video. Oh. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you for, for, for checking in on that. Okay, I'm going to share a video to wrap it up. Thank you so much. Great. I thought I had an option of being able to share directly from YouTube, but I realized that I didn't. Well, in that case. We'll, we'll move on if you're able to bring it up, but I'll, um, I just want to underline the link that you were making with the, with the Git, like how revolutionary Git was for open source software development and how that's been one of the blocking steps for open hardware to be not a local element, but something that works into a web. Um, so with that sort of first story in mind from Wikifactory, and maybe we'll get a demo of the platform. I bring him, you, I want to bring you back to the overarching mission of the Internet of Production Alliance that I was mentioning. So if our goal is for anyone everywhere to be able to participate in production, let's look at how open source software enabled that for information. So the open source or the open infrastructures of the Internet, the, the protocols, the data standards, the data systems, they're what enabled um, to the power to create, to create digital contents, to be, to be provided to anyone everywhere. They, they connected and they enabled those, um, these open infrastructure, they enabled the means of production of digital content. So we're very familiar with these means of production. I'm talking about our computers, our cameras, our phones, our microphones, we're all creating digital content. And it's thanks to open standards of the infrastructure of the, of the internet that we are able to whatever our competency and confidence level in in open source software or in software development in general to partake in that. Meanwhile, the open infrastructure needed to distribute the power to create physical things have been much slower to emerge. Um, like while the means of production of physical things are, as Christina was saying, uh, spreading, there are more and more of them, digital fabrication machines, open hardware, maker spaces, fab labs, hacker spaces to some extent, all of these are nodes that are able to fabricate something. These nodes, uh, they, they just aren't connected together yet. Um, but when you keep it, you can, and yet you could see that open hardware right now, especially, it's, it's like a building block that could be a public resource. Um, if we look at the, 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 the deep societal transformations that we need to address to, well, transformations we need to make to address the ecological crisis that are, that are rushing towards us, um, we need to have a responsive and local production system in place to be able to respond to that. Um, and I guess what brings the, not I guess, what brings together the Alliance members is that each of them is working uh, on different bricks of that, but they all need a common ecosystem innovation and transformation. And that would go in this, this ecosystem transformation goes beyond the each organization's domain of action. So in short, they need an internet of production to exist. And so we work together to build it. Because to make this tangible, uh, I'm gonna to give you the example of what open hardware is like for a lot of people right now. Um, not the most savvy of us, but just let's take a, a scientific researcher who wants to build an open flexor microscope, 3D printed microscope, able to collect data for whatever research they're doing. Today, finding, actually getting this Microsoft built, that depends on finding uh, 
academic, obscure academic web pages online that point them to the existence of that, then developing the personal connections that enables them to get the right information, um, accessing a range of uh, free, probably pirated software tools, disputes with colleagues over which platform and software package to use, many email conversations, improvised file sharing and we transfers and drop boxes, international travel to, uh, to do capacity building when the production actually goes, um, starts, uh, and probably calls private advice on how to assess whether the microscope is actually at the quality, the desired quality or not. And now we're talking about one location. So this is where our conclusion is that open hardware urgently needs open digital infrastructure to help it reach the potential that it can have. So another image of what this could be, slightly more complex, is something like this. This was developed, developed by uh, Helpful Engineering, um, by some of the founders uh, of, uh, of the Internet of Production Alliance, to see, well, what does not making of one PPE equipment when the COVID uh, crisis hits look like, but what does a system, an internet of production look like in terms of a knowledge framework, of the, like the open knowledge framework that would un underpin an internet of production? I do not expect you to be able to read any of the text here. It's just, a, just to give a sense that we are really talking about an interconnected knowledge framework. Um, right now, uh, the, these digital infrastructure that the Internet of Production Alliance is working on, uh, they take the form of establishing these big blocks that you see here, which is categories of data standards that cover the, the core five, six uh, elements that we identify as needed to make anything. First one is standardization of how we document how to make things. Second is a standard around where something can be made, where the machines are, where the tools are, where the manufacturing capability is. Uh, another thing that our scientists before was missing was who can make and what are the skills needed to make what you needed to make. The materials and components necessary to build the material. And interestingly, Christina was already giving examples of how that also will need to be forked in this location I want to make with this. And this other location I want to make with that. And you see the ramifications. I think a standard that enables you to then fork your information. All of this then brings us to the very real question of well, how does how does all of this get paid for? We are very far from a, a massive contract to an industrial plant that then ships millions of items. So what is what are the different contracting and business models? What standards can we use or what models can we can we share? There is also uh, for some for some of these elements, a question of transportation, especially if a cold, if a cold chain is implied, um, such as um, you know, uh, transportation of vaccines and materials like that. But we're not yet talking about decentralized vaccine production. But let's let's not say never. Um, this is this is the overall vision, and right now we're very proud to say that over the first three years of its existence, the Internet of Production Alliance has built the first two standards. Working on the third one, and by the end of uh, 2023, we will have started work on all of these standards. I'll I'll dive into the first two, and then the next two speakers will actually make this a reality and show you how these standards work for them practically. Um, so the first one, Open Know How, was released in 2019, and it is a data model to, for sharing metadata about hardware designs and documentation. The idea is to support discoverability of hardware designs online. Um, for any of you who, for whom this word doesn't um, bring an image to mind, there are eight, oh, 80 plus hardware hosting platforms right now, from Thingiverse to Kerribles, etc. There are thousands of open hardware initiatives um, and millions of designers sharing hardware designs, but there's no consistency or little of it in how the know-how is documented. And so makers struggle to access what they need. They don't know which platform to best find also prior designs of the person and what the intended use really is. is. So the design and documentation, yes, they are available, but it's hard to find and very difficult to reuse. 
So the open know-how standard supports the discoverability of open hardware, regardless on where it is in the World Wide Web. Is it on a personal website, organization's website, online platform? Standardization of how the documentation is enables searchability, discoverability. Uh, the next step of the standard will focus, will focus on portability uh, and interactivity of hardware designs as also key elements. And last thing I will tell you about before, uh, sorry, before I, I pass the mic on for uh, more stories is the open nowhere standard. Um, as it is pretty easy to get, it is a standard that enables you to standardize how you document the data of geographic locations of where machines and tools and manufacturing facilities are. It enables you to know where something can be made. Um, and another, I guess, image for this is uh, right now, digital maps have enabled you to find a store, a restaurant, a library, public restroom nearby, um, details of contacts, opening hours, reviews. It's often, it's become often uh, more efficient than, um, than the phone book. So the objective of an open standard for mapping of manufacturing capabilities for, man for manufacturing capability to also be able to come on, on maps. Um, you know, to be able to print for, I need a 3D printer near me, or I'm a designer who's recycling plastic. Where are the facilities that enable the items that I'm thinking about to be built or the items I'm designing? Um, because lots of mapping initiatives are out there, uh, often either at a, you know, uh, at a local city level or an NGO or a, or a wider regional mapping plan. But none of these initiatives are able to connect to each other because there's no standardization of how that data was mapped. Um, so what does this mean? I mean, it means like a nearby plastic factory can be matched with hardware designs or makers can find the machines they need. But it also means beyond the actual mapping, it means a lot of awareness raising because if people can see what can be made where they are, that changes attitudes. Uh, the idea that you have something needs to be made elsewhere and shipped in that's challenged when you see what actually exists where you are. Um, and I want you to picture a humanitarian health worker respond, preparing to respond to a COVID-19 response in a refugee camp and supply chains globally have collapsed their last priority in terms of arrival of equipment. Mapping what can be made locally, that brings the individuals in that community on the map and someone is going to talk about this way better than I can. Uh, Rawa, the uh, floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, Rawa Abdullahab from Field Ready, based in Baghdad, Iraq. Um, I'm very delighted to join to join you all in this uh, exciting panel and to talk more about uh, our program and how uh, like the open nowhere help us in our program. So um, first of all, Field Ready uh, like uh, meets humanitarian and reconstruction like uh, aid needs by transforming logistics through uh, like design, technology and engaging people into different ways and in new ways. So uh, basically we match, we match the supply with the demand and uh, work with the range of producers from established manufacturers to individuals. So, um, in, uh, we have like uh, different uh, programs in Nepal, Haiti, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Uganda, Kenya. So we are working with different also organizations like the GIZ, the Save the, Ch the Children on previous projects. So uh, we are working uh, with the uh, aid workers, engineers, designers, and many innovators like supported by a global network of, uh, of a technical like uh, specialist. So uh, we have like a program, which is the COVID-19 response program and how to protect the frontline workers and, and, and this like uh, the pandemic. So um, like our program is aims to fill the gaps of uh, hard to find items or materials related to the COVID-19 protection uh, and infection control items, which are unavailable or out of reach uh, for those who responded to the crisis, especially the medical workers, 
uh, the, the community workers who uh, work in the camps settings. So our, our programs like um, um, uh, mapping uh, local, local manufacturer capabilities to be able to meet those needs and uh, to finally making the PPEs and the, the, the infection control items to reduce the COVID-19 response or to, to, uh, to like reduce the COVID-19 uh, transmission. So um, our program like campaigns three humanitarian uh, innovations uh, like the, uh, the humanitarian open street map and the needs list uh, to uh, which are like both of them are working on the mapping the needs and manufacturing capabilities. So if you are talking about the global ch challenges that we are facing, uh, I mean the whole country is facing uh, during this the pandemic is like um, the supply chains are already delayed by the pandemic. Uh, for example, if you want to sh like to ship some items from uh, from a country to another, the pandemic and the you know the all the, the this this stuff type of lockdowns, the, the, the restrictions of traveling from uh, from one place to another, one region to another, all these like, just like, uh, get delayed the supply chains and chain and uh, delayed the items uh, from to, to reach the to the to, to the people who are like uh, who, who, who need it the most. So in our program, how we respond to this, we are like trying to do uh, trying to manufacture some PPEs and uh, infection control items locally. And uh, it's not only locally, we need to make it as near as possible where the needs are. So for example, in, 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 in Uganda, we are working inside a camp, uh, in, in, uh, in Kakuma refugee camp, we are like, uh, training some ladies on how to make face covering and uh, how to make hand drops and surprise soaps based on the uh, WHO standards. And um, uh, we also like making food operated tabs in hand wash stations locally in that refugee camp. And we also like uh, working on um, uh, plast plastic recycling. So we are solving the problem, the, uh, some environmental problems like the, 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 the waste, uh, waste plastic. So we are solving this by recycling the plastics to be used in the like the face shields. So um, all this like plastic collection are like uh, gathered in, in, in Kakuma and Uganda and making recycled face shield to be used by the health workers. So uh, like Field Ready has a team of engineers who are ensuring the quality on in each in each country in, in, for each item in each country. So our program is working in four countries in Uganda, Kenya, Iraq, and Bangladesh. Um, so uh, the other challenge is the lack of awareness of the local manufacturing capabilities. You know, before the pandemic, no one was like wearing the face mask. No one was asking about the hand drops. But these things just get uh, being sub like new to 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 the, to the to the people to the to the whole like it's it's a globally issue. So. Uh, now the needs are increasing to those things. So um, uh, mainly like China, USA, and Germany, where these, uh, according to some statistics, these three countries are mainly uh, responsible about manufacturing uh, these, these type of items. But as we said, like uh, how to transport or how to ship all these items into different countries, this is something uh, we need to solve it. So how we solve this in our program Program, we are looking into like um, uh, how to make the the how to look into the um, manufacturing capabilities and the capacities in each country and how to like uh, locally work on this. How to how we are mapping these by using the open nowhere standard. That means we can collect the same data from across all, all of the four countries in a coherent format data that is beneficial to those searching for manufacturers. So for example, we and when we are doing that, the, our data collection in, in a specific in, in one of these four countries, we are uh, looking into what type of capabilities the manufacturer or the maker have and what is the capacities of this, uh, like uh, this manufacturer, man manufacturer, and um, we are focusing more on the like manufacturing process. 
so for example, we are searching for where is the nearest 3D printers to the to these needs because with 3D printers we can we can make, for example, a face shield, or where is the nearest injection model uh, to our needs because also with the injection model we are we can make some uh, face shields. So by this, by using the open nowhere standards, we are trying to collect data and to understand the local capabilities and the capacities of the of the existing manufacturer and the existing uh, uh, like uh, uh, ca capacities. So um, this is one of the uh, one of the um, uh, our response to the challenges of um, like importing the the sorry the items. The other challenge is like the complicated procurement procurement mechanisms you know uh it's hard it's hard for the small organizations or to individuals to participate in attenders which is large organ which uh, mainly uh, like uh, dominated by the large organizations and you know all this time of uh, like the the time that needed to consume all the both for both part parties so uh all this get also get delayed uh the the the, the, the uh, like um from like delivering the items and the ppe's items to the people who needed the most so uh we are trying to uh, to we are having like our own platform where uh, both the supply and the demand can be merged in in this platform. So, for example, each organization get just uh, just uh, gets into this platform and put their needs. I need, for example, I need 10, 10,000 facials in in some in some area. So, what we are doing here, we are looking into which where is the nearest manufacturer who can supply these needs, who can uh, fulfill these needs. So we are matching this based on uh, our like a needs list platform. So uh, one of the outcomes and one of the outputs that we are like targeting and that we are already working on, it's like we are targeting to supply more than ten, uh, like a hundred thousand of people who will uh, need the PPEs. We are targeting these people to supply them with the PPEs, and we are we already like delivered more than fifty thousand of these items for uh, like more than 10, uh, 90 thousand beneficiaries, and uh, like uh, at the same time we are doing like the supply chain. We are like supporting the local manufacturer, the local makers, to uh, to to like uh, manufacture these those items. And uh, obviously, the transmission will be reduced within the, the frontline workers. One of the outputs that we are working on is like the maps, both of the needs and manufacturing capabilities in both in, in these four countries. To uh, like, we are aiming to map more than uh, 800,000 data points across those four countries. Uh, these data points, it all depends on the open nowhere standards. It's from uh, the, the data of the open nowhere and standards, like the the uh, the name of the manufacturer, where is the location of this manufacturer, where is the location of the machines, on um, what type of machines, what type of the manufacturing process, what type of materials they are using, because the all this information are needed to know in our program. And uh, also one of, of one of our outputs is to have an online platform with uh, like uh, APIs into uh, with integrations to both Meetsless and the HUT, uh, which is the humanitarian open street map. So in this regard, we are like having uh, items provided faster, cheaper, and better. And um, thank you so much for your listening. Bro, oh, that's that's. So perfect. It illustrates both questions of like mapping and business models and also what you do once you have this data and how you can build upon that. So thank you so much for joining us. I know it's also very late for you. So thank you. Um, the last person to speak to you will be Emilio, uh, who will who participated in designing the open know how standard and can tell you a little bit more about the application and the implications of having a documentation standard. Emilio, All right. Yes, I wasn't able to start my mic. All right. Um, 
Hello, all. I am Emilio Valis. I am the executive director of the Opopedia Foundation, and I'd like to share a little bit about our work using the Open Know How standard. But um, to get started with the idea, um, the Internet of Production Alliance is by, like, in the most basic sense, creating open infrastructures and then enabling people in all parts of the world to participate in production. And I'd like to focus on two words. The first one is infrastructures. And that can mean things like standards, um, that is doing things the same way, um, using the same methods, um, sharing in the same platforms or opening new platforms in ways that we can uh, communicate and pass information that is valid for production, which entails designing products, uh, transmitting them, passing them the data from one place to another, from platform to another platform. And then in the end, being able to reproduce a physical device. Um, and for us, uh, that means that there are different ways of reproducing. And I wanted to share three ways on which I believe it's important to think about reproducibility. The first one is about objects, which is, you know, we have all this information that can help us have the same exact device in one place and then put it in another place and just doing it by sharing bits, which are going to be turned into atoms. Then the second one is about the processes, how we perform this. And that means that we have to have a controlled environment to teach people the skills in order to build something. And then finally, the outcomes, which is something that uh, for us on Apropedia, because of our mission, that's a subject that really interests us. What are we building things for and why are they going to be used for? And, and having a sense of these three levels, I have to say that they're all important. Uh, that means that we can build the exact um, physical item in the way that we want it to build, uh, to be built and the way that designers uh, wanted it to be built, then that manufacturing is done correctly and things work, that uh, people have the capacity to reproduce something, having the tools, having the know-how, and then finally, that whatever is built is going to help um, the person solve a problem, a specific problem, and that it is similar to what the designer or the creator wanted it to be like. Um, so with this in mind, uh, since 2005, Apropedia has um, gathered hundreds and hundreds of different designs for the real world and documented projects that are some of them come from ideas to deployed devices that are working to solve sustainability problems or international development ones. Um, and we want to address three main questions. The first one is, which of all the different designs or devices that are very similar and, or uh, fulfill different functions should it build? Uh, how do I do that? And then will it solve my problem? And, and then we want to, give people enough information. First, we want to help people gather this information when they document it. And then we want to help uh, users solve a problem specifically. Uh, in regards to open know-how, Apropedia has um, implemented for over 1500 projects, uh, the standard, and now we're able to export and port to different platforms or colors on the web. So all of our project pages uh, have this standard implemented, which, which uh, shares specific information about the license, about the uses of description, et cetera. And then at the end, we have some of these uh, as part of the open know-how search uh, tool that has been documented as a first proof of concept for the, the standard. But inside of Apropedia, we've also developed like a, a very powerful search engine and you can um, create different types of search, searches depending on, for example, 
what part of the world has this been implemented in? Uh, what materials does it use? Um, what, how much does it cost, et cetera? And we've done a big focus on the sustainable development goals. So for example, here we're looking for uh, projects that are uh, trying to tackle the sustainable uh, development goal number two that have been 3D printed, et cetera. So, um, and with this, we're trying to build uh, processes and uh, actions so that people can document different types of things from um, showcases on how to perform a procedure, how to do something, to simulators, to devices, uh, to learning modules, all of this using the open know-how standard in ways that are discoverable for people. And then finally, uh, as a conclusion, we want to talk a little bit about what we expect to attain. Uh, and we have three things. First of all, support process of documentation, helping people document in the right way, but also iteratively in a way that is simple enough, but then can um, build up. And then secondly, help users embrace a multiplicity of real world solutions, because in the real world, there are many different ways to solve a problem. And we want to help people compare different projects, think about what is, you know, what makes some things similar to others, explore those ideas, and then, um, and then pass on all of this information to different actors, organizations, platforms that are uh, helping build the internet of production. So we want to work in collaboration with different uh, people who are interested in creating impact in the world. Thank you so much, Emilio. Uh, we are very, very much uh, over time because uh, we're all really passionate people. Um, so I will close our conversation now and open the discussion to the Q&A with the few minutes that are left. Um, and I just want to put a last message out there. We're recruiting both staff, but also we're growing the alliance. So if anything, reach us at info at internetofproduction.org. The floor is all yours. Thank you to my three wonderful co-panelists. <laughs>